Good morning everyone and welcome back to the virtual international conference on global research trends in biotechnology hosted by the Department of Biotechnology from St Joseph's College of Engineering. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest speaker for today's session Dr Nirmal K Sampath Kumar. He graduated with the highest distinction in biotechnology from Anna University in the year of 2011. He then did his masters in biomedical engineering at Université Paris Descartes and went on to pursue his doctorate in neuroscience from the same university. He was a master research inter- intern at the same university as well as at Université Paris Diderot. He went on to be a research intern at other prestigious institutions like University of Zurich and INSEAM. He then became a postdoctoral research associate at USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. He is the recipient of many awards and scholarships including the Paris Tech Foundation scholarship. He is a patent holder and has published papers in various journals including in the PNAS. Dr Nirmal has also been an active member of Race Rural and aids in spreading research awareness amongst rural students. In this community he was awarded the Young Researcher Award in the year of 2010. He is currently a postdoctoral scientist at King's College London which is one of the top 10 universities in the world. Sir, it is an immense pleasure to have you with us today sir. I request you to take over the session. Thank you very much Swatika for this wonderful introduction. Um I feel really privileged to take part in this wonderful conference that is um that is really conducted in this crisis time uh, which is almost impossible so um thanks to you all for conducting this wonderful um conference in the first place and i also uh, i extend my warm thanks to my mentor back in our engineering college professor parli subramani through who i got the contact of professor chamundeshwari uh, so thank you both for giving this wonderful opportunity and um um to be honest i'm i'm really uh, young and i don't know if i have a um enough thing to uh, take part in as a speaker in this uh, fantastic event thanks for that and uh without further ado i'm going to start sharing my screen and then share a few of my works um so for this uh, particular session i'm going to uh walk uh, with you guys um some of my key findings during the past few years in my during my phd as well as my first postdoc in uh, the benoin laboratory back in usc um so this particular presentation will have like three different sections uh this is the summary of my talk where i'm going to discuss rl hydrocarbon receptor uh it's discovery and a brief introduction what is ahr is uh from now on now onwards i'm going to call uh, rl hydrocarbon receptor as ahr and a uh, second section of this uh presentation will be i'm going to cover ahr's role in uh, peripheral nervous system particularly in terms of like myelin development uh, myelination and also its uh, potential role in peripheral nerve tumor and the last section of this particular t- uh, talk will be uh, ahr role in macrophage aging and uh, i'm going to explain like what is macrophage uh, aging and its uh, ahr's potential role in sex dimorphism in aging so uh, to briefly give the discovery uh, of ahr it's a very interesting story uh back in uh, we have to go back in 1976 where it was first described as an induction receptor by Pollen et al uh so what they saw is that after adding a uh, dioxin uh, they saw some of the um um uh, yeah so they saw some of the um enzymes like uh, uh, rl hydrocarbon hydroxylase and other uh, enzymes induction in the enzyme activity after adding tcdd and then they thought that there could be some receptor uh, involved in this induction of these enzymes activity so they called it as induction receptor back then since uh, then uh, after the discovery of ahr it is called as dioxin receptor and quickly introduce about the mechanism the the the, the, the ahr pathway so ahr is a ligand activated 
tra transcription factor commonly found in the cytosol. And uh, binding with the ligand, it translocates and sheds its chaperones um, proteins and then heterodimerize with ARNT in order to initiate the transcription of its target genes, CYP1A1 for example. So one such ligand would be um, TCDD, one of the potent ligand uh, agonist for AHR, uh, which is a very toxic element. And AHR is um, as acts as a receptor. And end of the process, we have the CYP1A1 and other cytochrome P450 enzymes involved in um, um, metabolizing these xeno um, xenobiotics. If you look at the domains present in the AHR protein, we can see that it has the BHLH, making AHR belongs to the BHLH superfamily. It has two pass domains, and it has ligand binding domain and transcriptional activating binding domain. Um, so when we look at the uh, endo, there's like several endogenous receptors that are um, um, uh, described in the literature, and as we can see here, uh, tryptophan metabolites are found known to be like um, endogenous um, endogenous ligand for AHR, and L-carnine draws the main attention because uh, we have this endogenous enzyme that can convert tryptophan to l kinorene and there's like a bunch of paper. The first paper that described hydrocarbon receptor endogenous um, ligand l kinorenin could be a potential cause for some tumors, and this particular uh, paper also discusses that it could be involved in uh, inducing the... Um, uh, hold on. Oh, sorry. I want to move this somewhere else because it just hides the title. Anyway, sorry. So um, it's just involved in uh, tumor progression. So moving forward, and uh, when we talk about the age of um, conservation in the evolution, we can see that the AHR homologue uh, found to be discovered here at the level of your core data all the way to orthoproda in invertebrate systems. And in terms of the invertebrate system, what is this endogenous role? So um, when we look at the um, uh, evolution, so AHR is found to uh, have this homologue called spineless in Drosophila that is first described in 1975. And it has a huge role in um, the retinal mosaic formation and also dendritic arborization and also neuronal development. So when we have the spineless mutated, we have the dendritic arborization disturbed and also the neuronal development also disturbed in Drosophila. So when we look at this uh, protein domains again, Please make a note that the ligand binding domain is also exist in the invertebrate system, but uh, for some reasons, all the ligands that are described in the literature so far that binds to the vertebrate AHR, um, not so far shown to have any interaction with the invertebrate homologue of AHR, meaning that this particular protein uh, acquired this kind of new xenobiotic metabolism function with the evolution where uh, so um whereas this particular protein has other endogenous roles as you can see here when you knock out uh, ah or homolog we have problem with the neuronal development so this uh, um, until like let's say early 2000 everybody was working with toxicology aspect of ahr but these these works draw attention to a lot of researcher in terms of like, what's the other role of AHR? So basically AHR is not just a dioxin receptor. When you look at the literature, the accumulating evidence show that AHR is involved in central nervous system development, uh, heart development, liver, kidney, you know, different things. And when our, one of the teams of my host lab also showed that when you knock out AHR, we have problem with the ocular motor system. And another team uh, from our lab also showed uh, that AHR ablation could lead to demyelinating kind of phenotype and also inflammation. When we look at the tumor, AHR behaves differently in a cell-specific manner that in some cases it, uh, it involved in the tumor progression and in some cases activation of AHR could be involved in a tumor suppression, these kind of things. 
and we don't know it's like it's a cell dependent manner so if you look at this overall picture hr is known to be involved in several uh, functions um i mean xenobiotic is one of the main things uh, that well documented and something is missing and in that case that's where i came in so we asked the question that what could be the role of ahr in peripheral myelination and peripheral nerve sheath tumor so we have a reason uh, to ask this question and i'll explain in a while so for this particular work i was doing a majority of my research in this beautiful 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 building from outside of course um in uh, um in shabels uh, with shabels team back in paris so the second section of this uh, talk we're going to uh, we're going to see what's the role of ahr in peripheral nerve system especially in myelination so to quickly introduce you what is uh, the importance of myelin several of you might know already what is a myelin is so let's not go deep into it but myelin is important for the uh, nerve conduction and the, for the salivary signal conduction in axon and this particular uh, myelin uh, is uh, myelination is basically an extension of schwann cell membrane in terms of like peripheral nerve system whereas this is achieved in central nerve system by oligodendrocytes so if we take a deeper look at the uh, myelin uh, lamella so we have this different uh, lamellae that are compacting on each other to form this nice uh, myelin sheet and this in this compaction the major membrane proteins involved are uh, namely p0 and pmp22 so p0 myelin protein 0 pmp22 peripheral myelin protein 22 and any problem with this uh, imbalance in the p0 and pmp22 protein proportion could lead to some kind of compaction problem and eventually lead to nerve conduction problems and quickly to show you how this uh, neural crest cells are differentiated to my myelinating schwann cells so there are several um um pathways involved uh, more um pushing or uh, progressing towards this positive or not positive like matured state so for example neuroglin one is involved in like um, when you have this positive activation of neuroglin one pathways or so schwann cell precursors are turned into immature schwann cells and eventually certain there are other pathways activation of those pathways could positively drive towards the maturation of schwann cells in making myelin and uh, we uh, showed we have demonstrated that ahr is involved in myelination as well as um, it could um, potentially be involved in uh, nerve sheath uh, no malignant nerve sheath tumor and perhaps a blocking ahr pathway could be beneficial so in this section we're going to quickly discuss the key results um and for example here um knocking out ahr um in mice um led to some motor deficits as we can see here the um, knockout ahr did not have show any improvement over the days whereas the wild type improved uh the learning so uh, motor coordination so as you can see here hr led to some motor deficit so uh this us uh, this made us question like what could be the um what could be the reason and then we designed experiment based on the like uh, is it due to some myelin problems so we used animals like complete ko and the schwann cell specific ko and i'm not going to discuss the schwann cell specific ko today due to some time constraints so uh, and also in the developmental aspect i'm not going to dis discuss like the developmental side of the uh, uh, myelination as well but quickly we're going to see what happened with the myelin in the animals in that case what could be the mechanism in terms of like the mechanism we harnessed the msc80 cell line which is a schwann cells uh, cell line and i have silenced ahr in order to demonstrate the mechanism behind this myelin uh, uh, myelination process and finally what could be the potential uh, role of ahr in uh, tumor 
that is particularly related to Schwann cells. So plexiform neurofibroma and MPNHC are two different neurofibroma. So one is benign and the second one is the malignant form. So first, in order to do that, we have to check if at all AHR is expressed in the peripheral nervous system. As you can see here, the uh, sciatic nerve, we have the expression of AHR, and we also checked in the MSCAT, the cell line that we use. So AHR is clearly expressed in these models that we used. And then when we move forward, so this is a sciatic nerve. So basically the nerve that runs from your spine all the way, like through your, through the thigh region. We extract, I mean, like I extract the sciatic nerve and some did some biochemistry and show you that P0, PMP22, the major membrane proteins involved in myelin compaction are uh, significantly increased with AHR ablation. And when we checked what's the thickness of the myelin with electron microscopy, we need to calculate the G ratio. Basically, you get the axonal perimeter and divide it over myelin perimeter and you get this uh, number. And as you can see here, increased G ratio significantly meaning that the myelin thickness is reduced with AHR ablation. We also checked the axonal perimeter. There is also increased, uh, significant increase in the axons uh, with AHR um, a knockout. So we wanted to know what could be like uh, the mechanism. So what I did is like silenced AHR in MSCAT. So silencing AHR led to increased uh, P0 uh, protein level, uh, intriguingly uh, reduced PMP22. And uh, we also checked in order to see what's going on with the transcript level. Um, I checked uh, P0 and PMP22 mRNA levels after silencing. As you can see here, P0 and PMP22 levels are increased uh, significantly. And I also wanted to check if it is happening uh, even at the promoter level. For this purpose, I've used P0 luciferase and PMP22 luciferase construct. And as you can see, a silencing AHR increased the transactuation of P0 as well as PMP22. So all this put together from the MSC80 side, when we don't have AHR, looks like there is an activation of P0 and PMP22 genes even at the promoter level. So one could think that uh, HR, given that HR is a transcription factor, um, uh, it could be involved uh, in, uh, you know, increase the, these genes directly by recruited at the promoter of these genes. So we use softwares. Um, uh, JJ did this MAT inspector uh, thing and then found one um, potential binding site for PMP20 and four different potential binding sites for P0 uh, promoters uh, using MAT inspector. And I, what I did is that I did a chip qPCR where I pulled down AHR, um, CYP1A1 being the positive control and H, uh, histone 3 as a uh, positive control for if the chip worked and IgG as a negative control, as you know. So um, as you can see here, the, the, it worked, whereas um, we did not see any recruitment of P0 or PMP22 uh, on any of those um, potential binding sites. So I was like wondering what could be like, if it, AHR is not recruited on the myelin protein, what could be the mechanism? And I went back to the literature. My own lab already showed, I mean, Sharbel and this um, team uh, already showed that uh, wind beta catenin pathway is a direct driver of um, myelination, peripheral myelination. So uh, le left TCF, uh, uh, so basically le um, uh, recruited at the level of P0, I mean, MPZ is P0 as well, you know that. So PMP22 level. And um, uh, then I was like, is there any crosstalk between AHR and beta catenin pathway? And there's like a bunch of articles showing that AHR and wind beta catenin pathway could have some crosstalk. And this PNS paper is a particular draw due to the particular interest because this particular paper showed that AHR can have some, uh, there is a PPI, protein protein interaction. We don't know if it is like direct traction, but it could be, that could be like a protein protein interaction uh, between AHR and beta catenin. Uh, moving forward, what I did is I basically I did a co-IP. I pulled down beta-catenin 
and as you can see here, and then blot it for AHR and uh, clearly um, a, there's a, um, AHR and beta catenin interaction at the protein level. Further, uh, I also wanted to see, okay, after silencing HR, is there a change in the level of beta catenin? So total beta catenin is also elevated significantly and active beta catenin as well after silencing AHR, meaning that AHR silencing could lead to active uh, wind beta catenin pathway activation. In order to check that, I took uh, some of the downstream, I mean, like not the downstream, basically, some of the components of wind beta catenin pathway and check the transcript level of uh, LRP signal, LRP, like the starting from the, the core receptor and all the way up to like uh, uh, target gene, which is axin 2. Pretty much uh, all of these components of wind beta catenin cat pathway is elevated significantly with silencing AHR. Meaning that when you silence AHR, wind beta catenin pathway is potentially activated given this hallmark axin 2 is also elevated. And then I wanted to check if even if the transcript, uh, sorry, at the promoter level, so basically super top flush, STF luciferase is basically a construct that has several binding sites for TCF left. And silencing AHR also uh, significantly increased the transactivation of super top flush, meaning that a wind beta catenin pathway is activated. So, uh, and further, one could now think that, okay, so now since we know a wind beta catenin pathway is involved in myelin genes, um, Transcription and uh, silencing AHR could lead to wind beta catenin pathway activation. Uh, so what I did is like I did a chip QPCR again. So I silenced AHR. I pulled down uh, beta catenin and checked the recruitment of beta catenin on the level of P0 and PMB22 promoters. As you can see here, that two re, uh, binding sites of promo, uh, P0 has significantly increased the recruitment of um, beta catenin, um, as well as PMP22 after silencing AHR. So we know that AHR silencing induced beta catenin recruitment on myelin genes promoter. Uh, so, is so we that part of the story is um, uh, concluded that HR is crucial in myelin uh, myelination. And moving forward, uh, to give a brief introduction about the neurofibromatosis NF1. So NF1 is a tumor suppressor gene, as you can see, it is involved in uh, uh, regulating major pathways that are involved in cell proliferation and cell survival. As you can see here, so um, MEG pathway, RAC pack pathway, mTOR, uh, PA3 kinase, AKT pathways. And neurofibromin is necessary for normal functioning of the cell when like uh, cell proliferation cells are available. And NF1 is an autosomal dominant human disorder uh, that has some mutation in NF1. And this is, the incident rate is one in 3000, so which is, which is, let's say, it's not that common, but still one in 3,000 is not that rare. So people having this um, this particular uh, mutation, uh, sorry, mutation, this particular gene could have some kind of clinical manifestation. 20 to 50% of the people may develop a plexiform neurofibroma, which is a benign tumor, as you can see. It's just like it's not... Um, it's not uh, fatal, but it gives some, um, I don't know how to say, like aesthetic, um, there could be some aesthetical issues with the tumor. Whereas MPNST is a, a benign form. So this new NF1 primarily composed, uh, composed of strong cells. And the treatment options could be like surgical removal of those tumors with and without of different combination, for example, radiation therapy or chemotherapy. And MPNST is the, 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 you know, the malignant form of this one. It's, it has very poor prognosis and there's no effective treatment. And this benign form of uh, tumor to the malignant form needs... Um, uh, some further genetical uh, genetic lesions. For example, if you just, uh, for example, if you have a mutation only in NF1, 
So malignant transformation needs further genetic relation. So if you have mutation in NF1, doesn't not necessarily mean that yeah, one could develop the malignant form of this nerve sheath tumor. So there, uh, there are several um, literature showing that there needs to be another uh, gene involved or several other genes involved in this uh, malignant transformation. So in order to see that we want, we collaborated with Eric Pasmo in the Curie Institute, and we first of all checked like what are the composition of this uh, tumor. And as you can see here, it has like Schwann cells, mast cells, and endothelial cells. And as I've already mentioned, like uh, the primary, the, 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 the like primarily composed of Schwann cells. And we checked the expression of AHR uh, transcript, like the AHR pathway transcript. Uh, as you can see here, it is highly expressed in Schwann cells. And uh, the tryptophan metabolizing enzymes also expressed, okay? And then we moved, we asked the question, what could be this expression level in the tumors? So being the, um, the dermal neurofibroma, basically the neighboring tissue being the control, we checked AHR, the endogenous repress of AHR, different um, enzymes that are involved in metabolizing, I mean, um, involved in uh, uh, making the endogenous um, endogenous ligand for AHR. So S100B is like, S100BP0 is being the marker of Schwann cells, and K67 is marker of like uh, you know uh, pro proliferation. So you can see here that plexiform neurofibroma, which is a benign form, you can see already that AHR shown to be a significantly increased, and the repressor of AHR is uh, significantly reduced. And the endogenous um, ligand making enzymes are also upregulated significantly. And further, when you look at the malignant form, it further uh, increased, the HR is further increased, and you can clearly see that the huge increase is the endogenous uh, ligand um, making enzymes, meaning that uh, there could be possibly HR pathway is activated in these tumors. So what I did, I took the, some of the MPNST cell lines and uh, I just show you for simplicity reason, just uh, one of the thing is called a a STS 2060. What I did, I inhibited the G, uh, AHR using just, uh, um, I show you just one uh, antagonist, a TMF with 10 micromolar, as you can see here, inhibiting AHR could lead to increased annexin 5 staining and PFI staining, meaning that the cells are uh, entered into apoptosis and also finally they're like dying. So, uh, and as you can also see here that this is a positive control that TMF is working, that uh, the target gene c one is significantly decreased. And in order to show that even further, that it's not something random, we wanted to use specifically Silence AHR with SAHR, and as you can see here, the the the, the AHR, uh, I mean, silencing AHR um, resulted in increased um, uh, in, in increased uh, increased apoptosis based on, I mean, like in a dose dependent manner. So 10 nanomolar and um, 20 nanomolar increased uh, the PI staining, as you can see clearly that the, this quadrant have more cells. So e, to summarize this, 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 this first uh, section of, uh, I mean like the second section of my talk is that, so there's a balance between AHR and beta catenin activity, let's say AHR and beta catenin pathway activity in the normal physiology. And uh, I mean, like the organism is happy, uh, or at least a particular tissue, there is no problem. In terms of like, imagine that we ablated AHR, so there's an elevated uh, levels of uh, beta catenin pathway that could potentially lead to myelin genes dysregulation. So there's a problem with the myelin genes tra transcription that could lead to thinner myelin and locomotor defects. In terms of like the pathology, for example, so AHR plays a crucial role in, uh, let's say, the balance between cell survival and cell uh, proliferation. Imagine there's this NF1 mutation 
that could already lead to a pathological form where there's a loss of balance in this thing and we have this tumor formation. And in addition to this NF1 mutation, imagine there's an increased expression of AHR that could potentially um, contributing in the transformation of malignancy, I mean like malignant transformation of benign uh, tumor to a malignant one. So that's the conclusion, conclusion of part one. And the final, the section three, uh, we're going to see HR's role in macrophage aging. Uh, for this, uh, I've, uh, this uh, piece of work, or this piece of work is carried out in this beautiful building, um, of course, from outside. <laughs> so in, uh, in uh, Bernice, uh, with the Bernice team um, at the University of Southern California. So uh, as you can see here, I was talking about cancer and uh, cancer is also one of the um uh, one of the things that uh, also age related as you can see here people it tends to increase with age as we all know that in including other uh, diseases like heart disease or, or diabetes or any neurodegenerative diseases and we all know that we all i mean like we all know a we all age and aging is inevitable and um, and there are a lot of uh, problems, as I mentioned earlier, could be uh, related to aging. And uh, thanks to Professor Essa, on the, who was a keynote of the first, um, who delivered his speech on first day, that we also talked a little bit about aging. Um, so I don't, um, I mean, he already set a stage for me there. So in terms of like aging, there's like, uh, I, at this point, there's like nine major hallmarks of aging that is described in the literature. Um, you can see here different of them. And Bernice, uh, the Benign Laboratory was primarily focusing on genomic instability, uh, epigenetic alteration. And uh, though they, they also work on other aspects of uh, aging as well. And when we talk about the aging, there's a new trend started uh, uh, early this decade that um, this inflammaging, so basically age-related inflammation, a sterile inflammation that's going on with the system as we age. And uh, when you look at this uh, inflammaging, so immune system play uh, human system plays a crucial role in this inflammaging, and as you can see here, that uh, immune system could be uh, categorized into two things: innate and adaptive immunity. And we there are several uh, cell types that are involved in doing this. Pro this two different wings of immune system, and we're not going to talk about that. But adaptive immunity. Immu uh, so we focused on the innate immunity as it's the first line of defense, and in particularly about the macrophage. Uh, why macrophage? Because it's one of the first um, one of the first few cell types that are involved in uh, responding to any kind of injury, and also clearing the cell debris in terms of like after an injury or with also aging. So um, when you talk about the macrophage, uh, so the diversity of macrophage is huge. Uh, basically, we have the macrophage. Uh, that are uh, bone derived. So basically, we have the bone marrow and we have the hematopoiesis going on. We have the monocytes, and the monocytes could be differentiated to the macrophage or um, uh, dendritic cells. So we have that throughout our life. At the same time, there are tissue resident macrophages, for example, microglia and CNS uh, derived from the yolk sac. And we have other um, uh, tissue resident macrophage. Uh, based on the tissue type, they have uh, different names, as you can see in this other app. So, uh, and macrophage are one of the major phagocytes involved in clearing up uh, any debris after an injury or any other insult. Uh, sex as a biological variable. Why sex as a biological variable is that um, I, it is, it is it, I mean, uh, it's a sad truth that a majority of the work, majority of the literature uh, being preclinical, even at the clinical level, um, do, do not include um, the other sex, uh, specifically, sorry to say, females in the study. And uh, that's a huge problem. I mean, we are 
uh, we're talking about SpaceX, Elon Musk, and then we are like talking about tailored or like um, individual, uh, in individualized, uh, specialized medicine for each person. And uh, even today, uh, other F, like you know, the other sexes, uh, not particularly ignored, but due to some um, some reasons, uh, it is it is not involved in uh, in studies, which is uh, uh, basically the other F population of the world is not involved in uh, included in the studies. So uh, in majority of the studies, so which is which is uh, which is which is a sad truth. And uh, in that case, it's also recent days. So sex is also involved. So basically, uh, we want to know what's going on uh, fundamentally. What's the difference between uh, males and females in terms of like inflammaging or these kind of things to in order to understand the basic um, uh, difference in terms of like uh, cellular physiology of different cells. So this particular cell uh, talks about the estrogen receptor uh, regulate the innate immune cells and other signaling pathways. And this particular cell is a very interesting one that, you know, uh, for example, microglia from females act differently after insult compared to uh, microglia from male mice brain. So in that case, uh, in Bernice, uh, with Bernice team, I mean, in uh, the Benign lab, what we, uh, what I did is that we focused on sex dimorphism in inflammation, and the second thing is hormonal cycling, which I'm not going to discuss today due to time constraints. So first, sex dimorphism in inflammation. So for this particular uh, study, what we did is like we received uh, mice of two different age groups from a National Institute of Aging (NIA) NIH, and <clears throat> And we have the two different sex, males and females. So what I did is that I extracted the bone marrow and differentiated them into bone marrow during macrophages with NCSF in the, in the flats. And then we performed some molecular analysis and also some functional analysis, uh, RNA-seq and phagocytosis, for example. So when we did the RNA-seq, as you can see here, blue being the males and free, uh, pink being the females, this multidimensional scaling analysis clearly show uh, that uh, sex has um, uh, like a huge role in having the transcript uh, in, uh, separated. And as you can see here, there's like 86 different molecules that are significant change in males only, and there's like around more than 500 genes that are modulated uh, only in females with age. Uh, so the transcription landscape is very different uh, with, according to the sex uh, when we age. And we checked the, the, some of the genes um, and uh, the, when we did the functional enrichment analysis, so they, these are some gene sets that are involved in functions like endocytosis, uh, SNR interaction in vesicular transport, and lysosomes. So this sounds something like there could be some problem with the phagocytosis, this kind of thing. So we did a phagocytosis assay. We took the zymosome, a uh, fluorescently tagged um, uh, uh, particle that uh, isolated from um, uh, yeast. And then what we did, we put the zymosome uh, with the bone marrow during macrophages and let it sit there for like uh, an hour. And after that, we checked uh, what's the difference between males and females and also with the aging. As you can see here, uh, there is no difference or uh, but there is a trend, a decreased trend, but it's not significant. Whereas in the females, there is a significant decrease with the phagocytosis. And as you can see here with the aged male and aged female, there's also significant decrease. Uh, so the factor has decreases with age only in females. So uh, as I did my PhD in AHR, automatically I went back to the RNA-seq and checked what's the level of AHR, and I saw that AHR is decreased uh, with age only in females, like similar trend with AHR transcript. So what we see here is a, a QPC confirmation of AHR uh with an independent cohort so uh, i show you just one cohort but this has been 
uh, tested in three independent cohorts. And so far, we always had this trend that AHR is decreased with age only in females, as well as the endogenous repressor AHRR is also decreased with uh, age only in females. And moving forward, uh, so what Bernice did is that is, um, uh, we, we wanted to investigate further. So uh, I went back to the literature as usually, and there's like a bunch of articles. I just show you some of the articles here, but there's like that. And even recent days, there's even more articles coming that AHR is crucial in modulating immune system. For example, this particular immunity paper where they showed that activation of AHR could direct the monocyte differences towards the dendritic cells, not towards uh, macrophage. So very interesting, and also AHR is involved in NLRP3 uh, mediated inflammasome, inflammasome and stuff. So it's clearly AHR plays a role in uh, immune system. And what Bernice did is that she took the publicly available data set of AHR chip seek analysis of dendritic cells, and just we compared with the 500 plus genes that are uh, regulated cell specific only in females with age. So we can clearly see this a uh, nice uh, overlap between these two and these 171 molecules, 171 genes. So when you check the um, functional function of these gene sets, so again, it's 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 mind blowing that we have this phagocytic vesicle, phagocytic vesicle membrane, lysosome, early endosome, and mitochondria. So clearly, AHR is doing something uh, with, um, uh, uh, with aging in the females. Going further, we check the string analysis of protein-protein interaction of AHR. And as you can see here, AHR uh, interacts with ESR1, which is estrogen receptor 1, and several other age-related uh, genes here, for example, um, uh, different genes involved in uh, aging. So conclusion of this particular part is that transcription landscape is different between among the sexes uh, in terms of like BMDM visual, uh, transcription, transcript landmark. And all females, uh, especially the BMDM have decreased ability to perform phagocytosis. Phagocytosis ability of BMDM is unchanged in males. So the age of transcript declines with aging only in females. So now uh, this, um, when we think about what's the take home message. So wh wh what am I trying to say is that AHR um, uh, is clearly um, doing something with uh, aging and there's an interaction. If you, if you look at the literature, there's an interaction between estrogen receptor and AHR as well. And putting all the data together, um, what I'm thinking is that AHR is uh, really, really important in modulating immune system that could uh, potentially be involved in um, sex-based aging. And also in terms of like this tumor and also in myelination and putting all together. So AHR, uh, as my title says, that uh, AHR as... Uh, multifaceted. So basically it has several roles and it's one of the major proteins that can orchestrate uh, different physiology of cells. Um, and, uh, that, uh, and, and I think that's the take home message of this, uh, this entire talk. And uh, uh, with that, I, 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 I thank my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Massad and his team and also all our collaborators back in Paris to uh, have this myelination and this tumor study. Um, and then um, uh, Professor Benayun and our team back in USC and all our collaborators for this particular work. And with that, I thank you all for your wonderful, um, uh, for giving this wonderful opportunity. I particularly thank uh, again, Professor Subramanian, uh, Parni Subramanian, also Professor Chamundeshwari and all the organizers in this wonderful, wonderful, amazing um, webinar that you have uh, organized in this particular COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and also St. Joseph's College of Engineering for this wonderful platform. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, sir.
Uh, thank you for an informative presentation on aryl hydrocarbon receptors and how they function, as well as like uh, telling us about how phagocytosis is uh, decreases in females compared to males. Uh, we have a few questions here, sir. So can we go ahead and answer them? Can you answer them? So, yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so the first question we have here is: Is aryl hydrocarbon a drug target for cancer therapy? Mm, um, so there's this company called GSK. They are trying to. I think. Uh, I mean, when I was doing my, I didn't. I didn't follow up, but at that time there was like clinical trial level one, phase one with GSK for um, skin cancer targeting AHR. So uh, I mean. Uh, AHR, given its multi-function, uh, my personal opinion is that it could not be a great target, but still people are trying, and uh, my patent application is also in that aspect. So it, uh, it could be a nice target, um, and we have to be very careful with, um, like, with a very good candidate. Uh, with a, I mean, like when I say with a very good molecule to modulate the AHR activity. And that is one from GSK. I don't know if, uh, if there exists some other compounds as well. I mean, like some other trial going on. Um, okay, sir. And the, thank you, sir. And the next question is, what are some of the ligands that bind to AHR? Okay. Uh, fantastic question. So, um, dioxin and uh, uh, there are other poly, I, um, uh, they call it as uh, pass pH, like uh, polyhydrocarbons as well. Uh, bisphenol A, uh, I, I believe, and uh, these are like some of the xenobiotics, like some toxic elements that bind to AHR. And there's like a bunch of endogenous receptors in our system itself, for example, L-kinerinin. Fixi is a tryptophan metabolite so basically, FIXI is formed by uh, um, UV radiation. When tryptophan is uh, radiated with UV, FIXI is formed, which is also an agonist for AHR. Um, there's also IC3, like indole-3-carbinol, which is from this food source. Uh, for example, broccoli, this kind of uh, green vegetables, including cruciferous vegetables, has a lot of uh, IC3 and there's like a bunch of paper coming out recent days that um, the uh, microbiota can have this kind of tryptophan based metabolites to have increased AHR uh, um, agonists. And uh, curcumin is also debated to be one of the agonists of uh, AHR. So curcumin, you know that we have it in the turmeric. Um, yeah, so yeah, these are the some of the more uh, uh, ligands that come to my mind at this point, yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually there was another question that said, can you tell us some of the dietary sources for the ligands that bind to AHR? Yeah, that's what I just mentioned. Yeah. So dietary things like uh, indole 3 cardinal comes to my mind at this point, and uh, that's what I said, like broccoli, uh, green vegetables, cruciferous vegetable in general, have a lot of uh, IC3. And uh, there is a paper, I remember, that they have uh, supplemented with some broccoli extract or something like that. They are particularly given IC3, I3C, indole-3-carpinol, and showed that it could be involved in uh, uh, monocyte differentiation towards dendritic cells. I think it's the immunity paper by Shinde et al. from uh, Canada. Uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, other than this green vegetables and... Uh, um, Things I don't know, but I mean, curcuma. So the turmeric that we use daily in our cooking as a potential AHR agonist. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, does persistent activation of aryl hydrocarbon receptor signaling result in carcinogenic effects? Uh, <laughs> fantastic question, but to be honest, I... And can AHR hmm. be targeted for other forms of cancer? What will be the efficiency? Hmm. <sighs> Breast cancer. Sorry, I have. Uh, I have. I'm. I'm sorry to answer. I have no idea. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. And also, in terms of other forms of cancer, I mentioned about this skin cancer. 
And in terms of this no-shit tumor that we did, uh, we didn't translate it further to animal models. And uh, in uh, I, so I left the lab. So uh, and to be honest, uh, my domain of research in terms of AHR moved a bit away from cancer side, and I'm not a specialist in cancer biology. So for this purpose, we collaborated with uh, a Dr. Pasma, who is a clinician, himself an oncologist and in Curie Institute. So um, I, 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 sorry, I, I don't have any idea in this in this uh, in this particular question. Sorry. Oh, so that's okay, sir. Uh, the next question is: uh, If a different ligand binds to AHR, is there a possibility of an opposite and a detrimental side effect? Hmm. So the thing is like uh, the ligand binding is based on the affinity. For example, dioxin found to be the most potent agonist uh, so far. Uh, and dioxin is coming from, it's an exogenous. It's coming from, we know that it's an environmental pollutant. And um, Fixi, which is an endogenous um, pro, um, ligand, also binds very potently, but it can't compete with dioxin. So let's imagine we have two or a few other uh, ligands um, in, in uh, given to the same type of cell. I think the binding of um, ligand to the receptor is primarily based on the affinity and also the dosage. Um, Normally, the the that could lead to um, uh, so the answer to this particular question is that if we have uh, different ligands, um, do we have some detrimental effects? So uh, to be honest, I tell you, just dioxin, just dioxin, um, based on the dose, may have different outcomes in different types of tissues and um, and also the, the for example for hepatocytes uh, or cardiomyocytes or these kind of things the tcd dose can be very different for example seven keto cholesterol which is also an endogenous uh, ligand for ahr and seven keto cholesterol so for example schwann cells and uh, these myelinating cells they're already saturated with a lot of cholesterol in them so may not respond to seven keto cholesterol, whereas if you have fixy, uh, maybe respond further because uh, I think it's also uh, the bio biological availability. So in that term, uh, first of all, we need to know how the binding is happening in order to know the outcome. And in terms of like detrimental result, we don't know what's going to happen and uh, given it behaves very differently in uh, different uh, cell types. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And the last question is, has the locomotor deficit caused by the AHR ablation been addressed? If yes, how it could be? Mm, okay, so basically the question, like if I, if I understood well, so the person who is asking is that uh, if you want to fix this, right? That's the thing, right? Uh, yes, I think so, so. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I didn't show all the results, but um, if I understood the question right, I mean, correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong. What I understood is that, so basically, you ablate the AHR, we have the locomotive deficits, and if you want to address this problem, how could you address this problem? So basically, this uh, loss of function or gain of function, this kind of knockout studies are there, to understand the, what's the physiological role of, of a particular gene and to in order to explore the, if it's cell autonomous or non-autonomous, uh, we use um, spe uh, tissue-specific or cell-specific knockouts. So basically, in, 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 in normal uh, physiology, we have AHR and this uh, myelin development is occurring in a normal way. Uh, so there wouldn't be any locomotor problem. Um, and this is the reason why we went to see the development. If you don't have AHR, the development is happening normally or not. Uh, at the same time, we also checked the pathological case. That's the reason we checked, okay, maybe the activation of AHR could have some detrimental effects. And that was the case. Um, if we have to address, uh, I would just uh, do a 
uh, rescue experiment, overexpressing, not overexpressing, basically having the same dose of AHR protein somehow with gene therapy in order to rescue the motor locomotive deficit. But we didn't do the experiment, so we can't know what could be the outcome. But that could be one of the strategies that we can try. Okay, so thank you, sir. Uh, actually, I have a question. It's not a technical one, uh, but I saw a slide in your presentation and it had a logo that said Mayava. Uh, can you explain further about it? Oh, fantastic. So uh, thank you very much for asking this, uh, Swatika. So um, a friend and I, a friend of mine from uh, now is a postdoc in the University of Megal, Ayapasami. Uh, so Dr. Ayapasami and I, we always wanted to have some joint venture, particularly uh, starting a YouTube channel long back when we were in France. And he also did his PhD in France, uh, but in a different city, Montpellier. So, and this lockdown, during this lockdown, we wanted to materialize. It's not we wanted to materialize. I think we, we thought it's the right time to materialize. And we started a, a YouTube channel, um, um, ironically, on a fool's day, 1st of April. And it's performing really well. And the name of the YouTube channel is Mayava. And Mayava is basically, uh, we wanted to create awareness among the Tamil community that if you hear some news or some scientific data or something, uh, please just don't take it for granted. You have to have some skeptical thinking and put your knowledge and do more research and do your own research and come up with a conclusion. Don't say uh, this particular YouTube channel, which is a uh, one of the top most YouTube channel or the top YouTube channel in Tamil. If he says that could be correct. No, not really. So put all the information that you hear uh, into uh, analysis and analyze them with your own knowledge and further knowledge and make some decisions. So this is where we are now. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Swatika, for asking this. And this is the reason why we started Mayawa. Oh, it's a YouTube channel. Okay. You can, you can please, you can, you, I mean, uh, participants or someone who is watching this YouTube live or later on, you can please go check out our channel. Just type in M-E-I-Y-A-V-A and Mayawa, and you can find us and please check out our contents. And then you are welcome to comment uh, if we did something correct or something wrong. And we are open to accept those comments as well. And please do subscribe to our channel. Oh, yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Um, so. I'd like to thank you again, once again, for taking the time to join us today and imparting us with your knowledge on AHR, sex dimorphism, and phagocytosis. Uh, also, we appreciate you taking the effort to de debunk various incorrect news via your YouTube channel. We will definitely check it out, and I urge the other participants to do it so as well. I'd also like to take this time to thank our patrons, our HOD, Dr. G. Shrikumar, our convener, Dr. M. Chamundeshwari Ma'am, and our co-convener, Ms. K. R. Preeti, for giving us the support and making this event possible. And finally, I thank all the participants for your cooperation and ensuring that the event was seamless. Our last session to conclude this virtual international conference is on engineering semi-synthetic regulons in yeast for non-native nutrient assimilation and will be given by Dr. Venkatesh Endalur Gopinayaran, who is a scientist at Liberated at Massachusetts, USA. That session will be this evening at 4 p.m. We appreciate you all for being here. Stay safe, and I hope to see you all in our last session this evening. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Swatika, for this wonderful uh, introduction, and thank you all for participating and all the faculty members for this opportunity. Thank you very much.